Welcome. Today we're going to be covering the Guide to Computer Forensics Investigations. This is the sixth edition. The material all comes from Cengage. They own and control all copyright material. I am just providing video lectures on the individual chapters for my courses using this textbook. My name is Arthur Salman and I'm going to be working with you throughout this book. Thank you. Chapter 5, Working with Windows and the Command Line. So in this chapter, we're going to be looking at Windows. We're going to be looking at the disk or the structure, as well as the file structure of a Windows operating system. We'll be looking at NTFS disks. We're going to be looking at uh, options for decrypting drives when a whole disk encryption is there. Looking at the registry looking at uh, the startup process and explaining the purposes at least at a high level of what's a virtual machine and why we uh, use them. All right, so let's jump into the file system part. So a file system basically allows the operating system to map the location of data on a drive. So when we talk about a drive, it's going to be storage portion. There's uh, partitions of a drive storage sections. Essentially, the file system just basically says where each of the parts of a piece of data file might be. So if we look at like a library system, for example, the library is going to contain thousands of books or tens of thousands of books. How do you know where each book is or how do you know where a collection of books are? Well, there's index cards. And in this example, the file system is like the index cards. It's going to tell you where a specific piece of data is or a book, or it's going to tell you where a collection of books are. That way, we have at least a map to find where certain things are. Keep in mind that each operating system may have a different file system or file structure. So Windows has FAT and NTFS, NTFS being the newer version. A Mac has slightly different uh, file structure. Uh, Linux machines have a different structure. So keep in mind that the file system is going to be dependent on the operating system. So is there a generic file structure that can be moved between most of these? The answer is yes. On flash drives or removable media, we have things called XFAT. And XFAT doesn't have all the same nice features that other file systems have, but it's universal. Meaning you can take a flash drive formatted to be the XFAT file system, and you can put it in a Windows machine or a Mac or a Linux machine or an Xbox or a PlayStation or anything with a USB uh, input and almost all of them will be able to read and write to that flash drive. Again, it may not have all the same features that like in a NTFS would have, but it's more universal. So when you need to access a suspect's computer to acquire data or to inspect data or to review, you need to understand what are the file structure and what are the specifics to the storage media? So that's one thing that you have to keep in mind is situations are going to be different. So next, we need to understand what happens when you're in front of the computer, you hit the power button. What's the process that happens? Well, the first thing that happens is that will initiate a power on sequence. It will check the CMOS. That is the complementary metal oxide semiconductor. This is basically what stores basic uh, system configuration settings, date, time, and very specific hardware settings that will power on the device. After that, it will check one of two things. It will check either the, the system's BIOS or the newer version called the Extendable Firmware Interface, EFI. This will basically outline what to do next. It will contain the program that will perform the input and output at the hardware level. What that means is it will initiate specific hardware sequences. It will start 
certain processes. And this is all happening in microseconds. This is something that happens extremely fast. This will also conduct a power on self test, looking at the processor, memory, video, and typically the power. And it will check to make sure all of that is functional, and then it will initiate the next portions of the hardware that it needs. That then allows us to talk about the bootstrap process. This will be contained in the read-only memory section, and this tells the computer how to proceed. This will display the key or the keys to actually enter the CMOS portion. This uh, actually cannot really be modified. It can be upgraded to a limited degree, but this kind of gives you the basic input functions. This is also where you can modify booting off of a specific device, like booting off a USB drive or a forensics disk. I don't know why they said floppy disk, but yeah. This is a very, very old version, but some of these uh, older uh, motherboards still use this old system. And this will actually dictate what is there. So let me grab my pen. You won't be able to use a mouse. Uh, this is a BIOS. You wouldn't be able to use your mouse, but you'd use your keys, and you'd basically tab over to the boot option, and that will tell you what's the boot order. And you will be able to see boot off of a storage device, or boot off of a flash drive, or boot off something else. On this particular motherboard, you'll happen to see that we only have a Western Digital Hard Drive, and whatever this HFS is, which I'm going to assume is an additional secondary hard drive. Not quite sure, but all those cells, we could look up the make and model to determine what it is. So, so since we're talking about hard disks, we need to understand what a hard, a hard disk is. Typically, they come in two forms, mechanical, and that's going to have the moving parts. Or a solid state, or SSD, solid state device. No moving parts. This is important to understand. When we are talking about a disk drive, it could mean either one of these. The more traditional disk drive is a mechanical disk drive. And that is specifically going to have heads and tracks and cylinders and sectors. It's going to have a specific geometry of the drive. And what we can see is here is our disk. Each wedge, this is a sector. Each ring, if I could draw, you know, a curved line even better, it's a track. The combination of a track it will form a cylinder and they'll actually stack on top of each other. So here we have one, two, three, four. We might have five or six platters. There's five or six metal discs stacked on top of each other. We have a read write head. And this is going to be a head that is between each disc. And that is going to move back and forth and read data off of these metal platters. Now, data is stored in a binary format. Yes or no? Is there voltage? Is there not voltage? That binary construct allows us to make up data. So again, each platter 
is going to have tracks. That's going to be the circular part. Sectors are like the wedges. And we may have multiple disc platters stacked on top of each other. There are cylinders at each level that build on top of each other. We also have a read-write head between each disc. So we may have X amount of read-write heads, X amount of platters. That will then allow us to calculate our sectors. If we look at how many bytes per sector, typically there's 512 big B or bytes per sector. You can calculate how many sectors there are. I have never had to do this in the last 10 years. This was very prominent with older technology, not so much with current technology. But understanding how the disk functions is still pretty critical. So this outlines important areas for us to understand conceptually how the, the hard drive stores data. But more importantly, we also have to talk about things like zone bit recording. Like where are the bits actually able to be recorded? How much, how, sorry, not how much, how many bits we can push into a platter before we start encroaching on a, a maximum limit. Because again, we're having to read and write data to each of these sectors. And these sectors keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And thus, there will be a certain point where there may not be the ability to record data on those sectors because they're too close together. We also have to talk about density. How many tracks, how many platters can we put together? How quickly can the read-write head read data across multiple platters? Does that impact data access? And it does, because the more the read-write head has to move, the more of an impact there actually is. Uh, impact could be speed of data retrieval. And almost all of this is done at the firmware or the hardware level. And again, we're not expected to be hardware engineers. This is just conceptually so that we understand the characteristics of a storage device. All types of solid state devices, SSDs, it could be a flash memory device. Well, just like a hard drive with moving parts, other long-term storage, SSDs, for example, they have their own characteristics. How much data can be written and read to the memory modules on that SSD? And that is called the wear level. When we look at a drive, we can look at how much data is re uh, read to or written to, read from, that specific device. Each time you read data and you re remove it or replace it, is there any remnants of that data left on that storage device? And the answer is typically yes. There is internal firmware for the SSDs that definitely ensure a even wear level to all memory modules on that SSD. The memory modules are also called memory cells. When we're dealing with SSDs, we have to make a full forensics copy as soon as possible. That's really important. Well, that's true with almost anything. That is because any time of access of that storage device, hard drive, SSD, flash drive, whatever the case may be, we may need to capture the unallocated disk space that is currently where no data resides because it may have historical data. It may have data remnants. It may have parts of previously overwritten data files that aren't completely overwritten. 
So there is a science to capturing that data. That way we can analyze it. All right, so now we have at least a basic level of understanding about storage and SSDs. In the Microsoft realm, in the file structure, the sectors are grouped to form what's called a cluster. The storage allocation unit of one or more sectors, that's the definition of a cluster. Clusters typically range from 512 bytes up to 32,000 bytes each. Combining sectors minimizes the overhead of writing or reading a file to a disk. However, let's say we have a cluster of 32,000. If we write a thousand bytes of data to it, well, it's going to use the entire cluster. So there is some give and take here. Clusters are numbered sequentially starting with zero. In NTFS, it starts with zero. With FAT, it starts with two. The first sector of all disks will contain a system area, the boot record, and a file structure database. Again, the first sector of all disks, it has the area, boot record, and file structure. This the file structure might also be called an allocation table, but this provides the structure of organization for a storage media. The operating system will assign these clusters some form of logical address. The sector numbers are going to be a physical address. That means that they're not changing. So the clusters can change and that's going to be controlled by the operating system. And again, that's the logical construct of the addressing part. Clusters and their addresses are specific to a logical drive, which is part of a disk partition. So let's break that down a little bit. Let's say we have a whole disk. Let's say we want 50% of it be a data partition. And that's going to be 50%. 25% is going to be backups. Partition. And another 25% is going to be the OS partition. What this allows us to do is to separate out chunks of the hard drive, the physical disk. Or we could leave it one partition and we can put everything in one. There are pros and cons for doing this, just depends on the circumstances. So again, a partition is a logical drive, so I'm going to draw that again. Maybe we organize this 50%, 25%, 25%, and this would be three logical partitions. Or we could do 100% partition which I think this is the most common in Windows, but it's kind of up to you how you want to do it. Windows OS's have three primary partitions, and after that you can have what's called an extended partition. Each partition can contain one or more logical drives. Basically this is just saying that we can chunk this up four times, but there's caveats to that as well. And each time that we chunk it up, we can then say what our drive is going to be. You could also say, you know, of this partition, we might, if we were rearranging it and then erasing parts of it and then modifying it, we could end up with what's called a partition gap. And that could be a sliver of data or a sliver of the partition 
that's not usable because we kept partitioning, removing, repartitioning, and reorganizing our physical disk. That does happen, but that's just when we're looking at our disks, we want to make sure that we understand that there is the logical partition and the entire disk as a whole. And when we're doing our capturing, we need to understand what, what are we capturing? Are we capturing the partition? Is that what our warrant, our justification document says? Or are we capturing the entire physical disk? It goes back to the scope of our analysis and our acquisition. We don't just make it up. Our granting body is going to tell us what we're allowed and not allowed to do. So let's talk about this boot record. In Windows, we have what's known as the Master Boot Record. This is located at the Sector 0 of the hard disk. In Hexadecimal, we can always find it with a 1BE. That's the traditional offset to identify it. The file system's hexadecimal code is an offset of 3 bytes. Again, 1BE for the very first partition. So let's look at that in hexadecimal. If we're looking at our drive, for example, we can see our offsets. Actually, I'm going to grab my pen. When we first look at a hard disk that we have captured or we're looking at the, bi or the hexadecimal versions of it, we're going to see things like the sizes. We're going to see specific structures up here of our sectors. Down here, we're going to see our offsets. Our offsets are going to be used to identify, well, here is our system code, 07. Then we're going to have our different portions of our sectors. So here, this first 2048, we can see that that is this box right here. And if we broke it down into our binary, we could see the crossover to show why that is 2048. So that's our first sector of each partition. The next section would be the number of sectors in each partition. And then after that is going to be our different offsets. And again, each partition's offset is going to start with 1BE, then 1CE, then 1DE, 1EE, and so forth. And again, I think this is way more technically involved than what a first year forensics analyst is going to need to know, but it's more about being able to show that there is a structure to it, even if you don't quite understand all of the different areas. So looking and examining a traditional disk. The traditional disk is typically called the FAT or the file allocation table. So this is basically the database which is typically written to the disk's outermost track and it will contain the file name, directory names, modify uh, data stamps, starting clusters, and file attributes. There are three main versions of our FAT. We have our older FAT16, our old FAT32, and well as our XFAT. Our XFAT is typically used for mobile devices. And again, the data size, the cluster size, are all going to vary based off of what type of storage we have. So let's look at that a little bit more in depth. Here we have a FAT16. How many sectors per cluster? And we can see based off the drive size. Realistically, we're not using 4 gig flash drives anymore. 4 gig. Like, that's not realistic. So we may end up with something way larger than this. And that's pretty common. 
all Microsoft OSs will allocate disk space for the files by individual clusters. The results are drive slack, and that's going to be the unused space in a cluster between the end of an active file and the end of the cluster. So if this is our cluster, and this is our data, this right here is called drive slack. And the drive slack might include RAM slack and file slack. It's just going to be the unused portion of a cluster that data is not currently residing in. This is typically an unintentional side effect of allowing things like FAT and uh, FAT16, FAT32. While this does help to reduce the fragmentation, it does have some side effects. And again, here is a much better picture. Here we have into file, we may have a RAM slack, and we may have some file slack if this was the end of our cluster. So when we run out of room for an allocated cluster, the operating system basically will find another cluster and will link it. So we may link multiple clusters depending on how large our file is. And all of them together make up a data file. You may have, for example, a 4 gig single file. Well, that's too big for a single cluster, so it has to be spread out between multiple clusters. An example of a Word document. This has six different clusters. And each cluster, they're chained together. When this is first assigned, basically we fill up the cluster the most we can until it runs out of room and then we find the new cluster. This will be the next available cluster. They may not be next to each other, so if we have a disk we may have a cluster here, we may have a cluster here, we may have a cluster here. This is called fragmentation. Defragging basically finds the cluster and moves it closer and then once it's verified moved it erases the data. It finds a cluster, moves it close, once it verifies it moves the data. That way the files are closer together, it's no longer fragmented. So if the next available cluster isn't contiguous to the cluster, again that's where the fragmentation comes into play. So how does that work when we delete a data file? So again, with any operating system when a file is deleted, basically what happens is the directory entry is marked as delete. This is done with a hex E5 character. It will replace the first letter of the file name uh, in the fat chain of that file is set to zero. Basically, it renames the file, and in the file allocation table, it shows as deleted. The data is not really deleted. The area where that data file is is just switched to unallocated disk space. If you actually are able to, to get in quickly enough, you can actually scan for unallocated disk space and you can recover deleted files. Maybe not the entire file, maybe remnants of the file or parts of the files, but you should be able to recover anything that was not overwritten with new data. So that's how it works with the traditional file allocation table or the FAT file system. Microsoft also has what's known as the new file system or NT file system. This is classified as the newer version. This is going to be what you see in Windows 7, 10, 11, and so forth. It improves over the file allocation table file system by allowing you to have better parameters, allowing you to have better attributes, having better characteristics. 
it provides additional features. NTFS provides more information about a file, has way more metadata, it gives more control over the objects. It allows you to handle individual security permissions on an object level basis. A folder, a file, all of them are objects. And now you can control permission to each object. Microsoft has moved towards a journaling file system. Basically, it records a transaction before the system carries it out. That way, if there is an issue, and in the middle of writing a data file, for example, if there is some corruption, well, there's a journal or transaction of what's going to happen before it is actually uh, done. That way, you can actually recover at least more of the data than you would prior to journaling. Again, journaling is just recording the transaction, recording what you're going to be doing before it actually is carried out. That way, if there is an error or an issue or a power loss, you do not lose or have that data corrupted because you have a transactional log of it. So again, I, I said the word object, and that is because anything written to a disk is, is an object uh, or a file. For NTFS disks, again, the first data set is that partition boot sector. Next will then be the master file table or the allocation table. This provides the same general structure that FAT does, but the names are slightly different, but the functionality is pretty similar. NTFS does result in a much a smaller amount of slack space or wasted space. And you'll also see in just a second that cluster sizes definitely allow for a different change up based off of the data. Clusters are smaller for smaller disks and larger for larger disks. NTFS also uses Unicode, and that's the international data format, so it makes it a little more universal. So let's look at the cluster size for different disk sizes. So a traditional 2 terabyte hard drive, it's going to have 8 sectors per cluster. It's also going to have clusters of 4 kilobytes. The larger the drive, the larger the cluster size. The larger the cluster size, the larger amount or the greater amount of sectors per cluster. That's how we're able to achieve the much larger storage size. Now, keep in mind, I don't think I've seen a storage device that uses more than a four kilobit cluster size because I'm not really seeing, you know, above 16 terabyte storage media, but it is possible. The master file table will contain information about all the files on the disk, and that includes all operating system files. The MFT is the first 15 records, and they're reserved for the system files. And again, all the records in the master uh, file table is called metadata, or data about data. So, the next thing is... What is this metadata and what are the specific reserved records for the file system? For example, we may have the MFT, the MFT2. And these are going to be uh, content or data about positions of allocated space or remaining space. For log files, that will be in a the, the third recorded position, number two. Because we start with 0, so 0, 1, and 2. That will give us our log information. That will be our transactional or our journaling logs. Third will be the volume information. And that's going to be information specific to the volume, such as the label, the version. All of that's going to be stored in this third position. And it will be called in a file called volume. You'll notice dollar sign is a way to hide them. We also have things like our attributes, position four. That's going to be a table listing all of the attributes, names, and numbers. We have a root file index. This is going to be the root folder on the primary NTFS volume. 
we have our boot sector that's going to be position six and seven whether it's part of the bitmap or boot section and that's going to be mapping out the partitions as well as mounting the volume that will be used during the bootstrap process to identify the operating system we also have the recorded section 8 which is bad cluster any part of the drive that is classified as damaged will get a bad cluster we also have a secure file section that is record position 9 and this is where we're going to act do our ACLs are maintained and our other security aspects of any object we have up case table and that converts all lowercase characters to uppercase for the unicast or the Unicode characteriz uh, characterization. We also have extended position 11, which is the extension file for our NTFS. And this is optional. And then recorded positions 12 through 15, that's all for growth. Every few years when Microsoft comes out with another operating system, we get updates to NTFS. And so we are going to see probably with Windows 11 or later versions of Windows record positions 12 through 15, at least one or two of them used for the additional characteristics or attributes of the next generation of NTFS. So let's look at some of the nitty gritty. In the NTFS master file table, all files and folders are stored in separate records about uh, a thousand uh, bytes each. Each record will contain uh, object information or uh, object attributes. This information is divided into record fields containing metadata. A record field is referred to as an attribute or an attribute ID. Any object information is typically stored in one of two ways and that's either a resident or non-resident attribute. Now we're going to get into that a little bit later. Files larger than 512 bytes are stored outside the uh, MFT. The MFT will provide cluster addresses where the file is actually stored. This is referred to as data runs or the chaining of clusters. Though if you ask on an exam, the official title would be a data run. Each MFT record starts with the header identifying it as a resident or non-resident attribute. Some of the attributes might have standard information, attribute lists, file names, object ID. If there's a security descriptor, that might be access permissions, volume name, volume information, the data, that'll be file data for the resident file, or the data runs for non-resident, meaning resident is small enough data to be stored in the MFT. A non-resident is too large, so it's going to show you the data runs or where the clusters of data are, chained clusters. We also have an index root and an index allocation, and that's going to be implemented for the use of indexes in the different files and folders. We have our bitmap that will identify the cluster status. We have our parse point. This is the field for volume mount points for the insoluble file systems filters. We also have things that might use other file systems like the OS2 HPFS file system or if there's any logged data, and that's gonna be used for the encrypted file system, or EFS. So again, like this is the overall structure of the attributes in the MFT. And again, we're just kind of giving brief overviews, not super in-depth, because right now we're just trying to get conce uh, concepts based uh, over and not you know, drilled specific data points. It is a lot and it is confusing sometimes, so that is why just the runs over four core concepts. Here is the file attributes as laid out in a hexadecimal table. And we can see the starts of attributes, we can see the different types of attributes, and kind of where they're organized. And here is 
another form of attributes, the start of non-resident, uh, the length of non-resident, the attributes of non-resident, and the starting point of the data run. When a disk is created using NTFS file structure, this defines the logical structure of the disk. It also assigns a logical cluster to the entire disk partition. These assigned clusters are called logical cluster numbers, LCNs. The LCNs are predominantly used when a file is too large, so the data has to be written to a non-resident file. So they're going to use the LCN address to assign it to the data. The LCN becomes the file virtual cluster number, VCN, for identification. For the header of all of the records, the record file of interests are going to be the different offsets. So an offset of 0, 0, that will identify a file. A offset of 1C through 1F, that's the size of the MFT record. An offset of 114 will be the length of the header. An offset of 32 and 33 will be the update sequence array. And again, this is just if we're looking at the hexadecimal value in a hex editor. We can see the different offsets. Here's an example of a update sequence array where the data goes into position. We could see the record identification. We could see the length of the record. We can see the size of the entire record. And we can also see if the data is swapped with the data in position. So there's a lot of information here that we have to spend some time to unpack. Here we have some standard information. The creation date, attribute, last modified, size, last access, and if there's been any recorded updates, and that'll be both the day and time as well. So again, a lot of attribute information that can be viewed at the hexadecimal level. And here we have, again, the structure kind of more combined. We can see the attribute short names. We can see the last modified. We can see the portions of short and long full file names and back and forth. Again, this is more of just get your feet wet and understand, not have to go through and understand each and every attribute yet, because that's a way more advanced topic. Here we have the attributes for an object ID, for example. We can see the attribute, the size of the attribute, the starting position of the GUI data, as well as the starting position of the GUI data. So here we have a offset of 18, and then we can start seeing the started positioning of that data. So moving forward, we also have things like our resident flag, the starts of attributes. Again, some of this is going to be over most learners' heads the first few times. Right now, the goal is to understand that there's a structure and that these attributes can be viewed at the hexadecimal level. Here's an a example of the start of attributes for a non-resident file, so outside of the MFT structure. We can see the data run, the MFT record section. We can see the sector checksum and sector boundary. So part of this is just kind of getting you to the point where we can decode some of the different sections. And, and again, we have lots of labs walking through looking at the hexadecimal view of a lot of these data files. We also have what's known as an alternate data stream. And this is where we can have data that's appended to an existing file. It's data within a file. This can be obscure uh, valuable evidence. This can be intentional or coincidence. This could be if you want to hide something and most users won't be able to find it. In NTFS, an alternate data stream, ADS, becomes an additional file attribute. 
and it allows the file to be associated with different applications. You can only tell whether a file has a data stream by examining the MFT data entry. And you can do this not necessarily looking at the hex, but this chapter is very heavy looking at our hexadecimal of our data file. You can also look at this via the command terminal. The alternate data stream is, again, just a way to have an additional string of code inside a data file. So you could have extra words, you can have extra content. With NTFS, we have the ability to encrypt as well as compress files. NTFS provides compression very similar to FAT drive space. NTFS allows you to compress the entire system volume, the entire partition or folders or files. Most computer forensics tools can also uncompress and analyze the compressed data inside a Windows environment. Because we talked about NTFS compression, we also have to talk about NTFS encryption, also known as the encrypted file system. Introduced in Windows 2000, we do have a asymmetric key for encrypting and decrypting our data volumes. There's also the ability to have a recovery certificate that is generated and sent to the local administrator. That way, if there is a key mishaps or a uh, key deletion, we have a way to recover that data. Users can apply the EFS to a file stored on any local workstation or anywhere that NTFS resides that they have access to. It could be as simple as right click, selecting its properties, and then clicking encrypt. That checkbox and clicking OK will then cascade this EFS. What I mean by that is it literally will do a encryption on the fly of that data file and your locally logged in user will have the key to read the data. So if you have the ability to encrypt, the recovery or the recovery agent is kind of important. So we have what's called a recovery key agent and this is implemented to recover the certificates, which is the Windows administrator account. The administrator account can recover a key in one of two ways through Windows or through the command terminal. The command terminal are going to be through Cypher or Copy. And again, there is a lab, I believe, that covers both of these commands for encrypt, for recovering certificates for decrypting of data files. So when a file is deleted in NTFS, the OS renames it and moves it to the recycling bin. Basically, you can use the delete ms command and this will eliminate the file from the MFT listing the same way that FAT does. So you can do it through the graphical interface or through the command terminal. What happens when the data is too big though? What happens when you have a very large storage requirement? Well, we have what's called the Resilient File System, or REFS. This is designed to address very large data storage needs and that's going to be used like the cloud or large SANS. We have this, these features for maximizing data availability, integrity, and also make it scalable. REF does use the structure very similar to the MFT in NTFS. And in modern day operating systems, you can see the REFS as a option as opposed to NTFS. In recent years, because of the growth of PII, we also have the ability to do whole disk encryption. Meaning, when you're not concerned about data access, but you're more concerned with data protection, you can say encrypt the entire drive. And you have to decrypt it every time you want to use that drive and that's feasible in like medical or within law or within very specific industries. A particular concern is what happens when you have critical data on like a laptop and it gets stolen. 
having the ability to encrypt the entire storage is kind of important. And you can do that. So current hold disk encryption tools offer, you have to actually pre-boot, you actually have to go in, and before the hard drive's initialized, you have to enter a decryption key. You can do full or partial disk encryption. You can actually use your different algorithms for the encryption, and there's some key management options. It really just depends on the circumstances or the situation that you're trying to accomplish. So how does this work? Hold disk encryption will encrypt each sector of a drive separately. Many of the tools will also en encrypt the boot sector as well. That way you cannot bypass the encryption process. To examine an encrypted drive, you have to decrypt it. That's the only way. You can run a vendor specific tool for decryption. You could try breaking the encryption or you should find a way to bypass. Uh, might we have a one-time passphrase or an OTP for bypassing for specific vendors. And that is not a guarantee, that just might gain you access. The point of encrypting the data is so that it's not readable. So trying to break the encryption doesn't necessarily mean that you can break into the drive. Does Microsoft have a whole disk encryption? Yes, it does. It's known as BitLocker. It was first available in Vista, but it's pretty much in every version of Windows now. It has a hardware and a software requirement. Basically, you have to have a TPM microchip. You have to have a BIOS that's new enough to support it. And you have to have at least two NTFS partitions. Basically, the, config or the BIOS will be configured or the EFI will be configured so that the hard drive boots first, then it checks other bootable peripherals. Essentially, with that, you can set it so that the BIOS will prevent anything else from loading other than that primary drive initially. That way, there is no way to bypass the encryption of that drive. We also have third parties. Uh, endpoint encryption, voltage, uh, TrueCrypt, and more. All right, so let's move away from encryption. Let's talk about the registry. So the registry of the database that stores all key values of every setting on the entire system. It talks about the hardware, the software configuration, user preferences, your right hand, left hand mouse, all of that is saved in the registry. When you're looking at control panel, in reality, you're looking at a graphical editor of the registry. You can access the registry editor by going to the run menu and typing regedit. This allows you to modify the registry directly. However, if you do this, you can seriously destroy your computer very quickly. So you have to be mindful of the settings. We have uh, registry keys. Most of the registry is stored in what's called an, a hive key. There are groups of similar functions that are organized into these hives. And each hive has keys and sub keys and branches that outline all of the different settings. Some of the core registry file location. Uh, if you're dealing with an individual user and they have any customization, that's actually going to be stored under the user profile and it will be stored in an ntuser.dat file. This is a user protected storage area and it contains the most recently used file and uh, desktop configuration where each file is located on your desktop. It's going to be stored in this ntuser.dat. Uh, computer settings. It will be stored in the system32 configure default.dat. User account credentials, sam.dat. Anything with security settings, security.dat. What software is in, installed, that's going to be in the software.dat. What are the system specific configurations, that'll be done in the system.dat. 
And if there's any additional end user information that might be needed, that'll be stored underneath System32 configure SysTemp profile location, and that's going to give you the additional profile data that you need. So again, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is the more common locations of registry files. And you're going to be noticed almost all of this is stored as a .dat file. All right, so how is the registry viewed? When you go to regedit, this is what you pull up. You pull up the five predominant H keys, class root, current user, local machine, users, current configuration. Each one of these H keys are going to have sub keys and keys that define very specific things. Uh, anything with all users are going to be underneath HK users. Anything about the local machine, the current configuration of that hardware is going to be under local machine. Anything dealing with specific information about the current configuration, it'll be under the current config. We also have things like the current user. That's going to be a symbolic link to users, but a subsection of the currently logged in user. We also have the H key class root. This is basically the symbolic link to local machines, software classes, and this will provide a linkage between the file extension and what application to open them. The current configuration is again symbolic link to the local machine systems and looking at the current control of the hardware profile. In older versions, we have what's called an H key DNY data, and this stores the hardware configuration, but again, it's no longer used after 2000. There are a lot of built in tools for viewing the registry. FTK has a great tool, Forensics Explorer, OS Forensics, X-Way Forensics. There's a lot of different methods to examine the registry. Again, the more important part is to be careful. You can actually search the registry and you can look for applications. But again, you have to be mindful of what you are looking at and how you modify them. Sometimes changing one bit means the stopping of an entire application from running. So let's move into startup. What files are necessary when Windows turns on? That's going to be based off the operating system. This information will help you determine when the computer was last accessed or what things might be loading, things of that nature. So Windows 8 and Windows 10 are multi-platform operating systems, meaning they can run on laptops, desktops, tablets, smartphones, and more. They actually have a boot configuration storage location. The boot configuration data, or BCD, outlines the boot loader information that will initiate the system bootstrap process. Basically, as you start Windows, if you tap F8, you will get a bootloader menu that might allow you to access maybe the recovery option or advanced boot options. That is where you can actually view the BCD data. Or you might have to load a terminal and then from the terminal open up the BCD data. But again, all of this is to outline the boot process. The generic boot process is hit the power, bo uh, power button that loads the posts, power on self-test that checks, processor, memory, video, power supply. That, once that is checked out, it will initialize the startup. That will load the bootloader. The bootloader will find the storage device and will look for specific hardware. The hardware detection and configuration will find what primary drive is being used and what partition of that drive houses the operating system. From there, it will load the kernel. From the kernel, it will load all software applications that are necessary to prompt the user for a login. Again, all of this is done in a very short amount of time. But understanding the process allows you to troubleshoot what might be going on if a computer doesn't fully boot. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. 
So the startup files for Windows Vista, for example, there is a NTLDR program that is used in older operating systems that are used to load the operating system. It's been replaced with newer, more modern day versions. Boot Manager, WinLoad, WinRim. Basically with Windows Vista, Windows Vista has the BCD editor and it will modify the boot options this replaces the Windows XP boot INI. So again, XP had the NTLD program and a boot INI. Vista and above have the boot manager, the win loader, the win resume, and now BCD. For XP, we had the boot INI, the HAL.ELL, the boot sector.dos, and a lot of these older files, pagefile.sys still exists because that's still classified as a page file. With XP, we also had, again, like the HAL. That was the hardware abstraction layer. We had our user32, and that was a DLL subsystem. So a lot of these were OS generation specific. XP or Vista or 7. Even though realistically you should not be encountering XP or Vista anymore, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not still there. Because sadly, XP, Vista, Windows 7, all end of life, but are still pretty common in the field, especially in the business realm. So you may deal with computers that might have contamination concerns from XP meaning you've upgraded, it may still have remnants of XP. When you start an XP machine, several files are also accessed. So the contamination might be just simply because you started Windows XP. That will cause contamination, meaning the file attributes of all the files, all of that is going to be modified. That might destroy potential evidence. When you're looking at a upgraded Windows 7 machine, it might also have remnants of Windows XP, and so there could be contamination from a, an older operating system, so you need to keep that in mind as well. The last major thing we have to discuss is virtual machines. A virtual machine is a software-based computer that will use your existing physical machine's resources. It allows you to run different operating systems on your physical machine. Let's say you have a laptop. You have a hypervisor, something that allows you to create and run VMs like VMware Workstation or VirtualBox. You will create a software machine inside of your physical machine, so your laptop now has its primary operating system, but it may also have a virtual machine inside of it that might be running Linux or a Mac OS or a different version of Windows. It provides you a desktop, it provides you all of the items that you'd have with a physical machine, but it is using the underlining hardware. So for example, you have a laptop, if you have 32 gigs of memory, you have 32 gigs total. So if you allocate some to a virtual machine and some to your physical machine, you cannot go over how much memory you have. You have a finite amount of resources. Same thing with processing power, same thing with hard drive. In digital forensics, virtual machines are making it possible to restore a suspect's computer by capturing their machine and doing what's called a physical to virtual machine conversion or capturing their drive and saving that as a virtual disk. All of that allows us to work with these software based operating systems now. It makes it a little easier to spin up and work with different operating systems on the fly. However, implementing virtual machines opens up a whole new level of complexity that we're growing with. 
there are, again, a hypervisor. That's going to be the software to actually open up a VM, like VirtualBox or VMware has their workstation. Uh, oftentimes, VirtualBox is free, but it's very limited. I tell learners start with VMware workstation. It's a little more intuitive. All right, that is the end of this chapter. We looked at Microsoft specific allocation tables. We looked at NTFS in depth as well as MFT. And we looked at file slack, the registry, and virtualization. Questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. All right, now that we've wrapped up some of the material for this chapter, are there any questions? There's a lot of different material covered. So again, the key thing is, as you're going through the material, whether it be the reading, whether it be the videos, ask questions, write questions down. The more that you can engage your brain in this material, the better you are at retaining the information. So again, questions, please feel free to, to reach out and we will go from there. Thank you and I look forward to working with you throughout the remainder of these modules.